Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Shanta Devarajan. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth seminar in this Future of Development series. And I'm particularly delighted today that we will be discussing the theme of the politics of development. Um, we, and we have two distinguished speakers. Um, the first will be Professor Leonard Wanchikon. Leonard is the James Madison Professor of Political Economy, the Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. And I should add that he's the founding president of the African School of Economics, uh, of which I am proud to be a member of the board. Um, and our discussant is uh, Sarah Khan, she's a professor at Yale University's political science department. Uh, and Sarah also is, the, is an associate fellow at the Institute for Development and Economic Alternatives in Pakistan. So not only are these two people uh, teaching in the two of the best universities in the world, but they're all both deeply uh, involved in their home country's uh, development. Um, the, the, the proceedings would be that Leonard will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, followed by Sarah, uh, whose uh, discussing remarks will take about 15, uh, 20 minutes. And then we will open up for questions uh, from the audience. Um, and you have three ways of uh, submitting questions. And, the, and, and we will put this up on the screen as, as we go along. But one is you can send an email to events at cgdev.org. You can tweet at, uh, and the uh, Twitter address is at cgdev hashtag cgd talks. Or you can send comments via the YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. The one thing I would say from experience is that you should uh, start submitting your questions as the uh, speakers are speaking um, so that we have enough time to listen to all the questions. Otherwise, sometimes we end up getting a rush of questions at the end uh, when we don't have time to, uh, to address them. So uh, with those uh, opening words, uh, let me hand it over to Leonard to uh, give us his presentation on political distortions and economic development. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much uh, for the invitation. I'm extremely uh, excited about uh, uh, the opportunity um, to share my views on such a really, really crucial and important um, topic for, 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 for development, which is uh, uh, the politics of development. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk is Political Distortion and Economic Development. Um, I will start with um, the following uh, motivating uh, slides. First is that you know, differences in living standards across countries are large and persistent and is linked to growth trajectories. And they are driven in part by productivity gap or misallocation. And what is even uh, critical is that those disparities um, are driven in large part with um, you know, disparity in capital and, and labor. And the current explanation of those uh, differences are market-based, you know, differential in productivity in particular, uh, driven by lack of market integration, for instance, technology adoption, information friction, access to capital, and in the context of Africa, um, Sorry, one... Leonard, Leonard, your slides are not advancing. Uh, oh, okay. Are you advancing them? Yes, I am. So let me start over again then. Uh, sorry. No, it's okay. We heard what you said, but it'd be nice. Yeah. To see. So, okay. Let me try. Let me start again. Okay. 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 Uh, sorry. Uh, so is it advancing now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So um, I was 
I was um, basically referring to the specificity of Africa in particular, and maybe other countries in Asia, where some long run factors like pre-colonial institution, colonial institution, ethnicity or ethnic conflict of rationalization have been added to the market-based factors that drive divergence in growth trajectory and income. So, but recently um, we, we have to assert that um, there is a convergence in growth rates and institutions. You know, uh, you know, Africa, for instance, have seen um, its GDP per capita more than double. Institutions in Africa are looking more and more like the one from the around the world. So, which give us an opportunity to rethink uh, the way, the role that politics and political institution can play uh, in development. So, what I'm going to do in this talk is to provide, first of all, a theoretical framework that captures what we expect or what governments and politics ought to be to promote development. And then we are going to look at deviation from this optimal, I should say, arrangements in the role of government institutions. And those deviations, we are going to term them as political distortion. The term political distortion is going to, to help me to integrate different factors, like whether it's uh, firms driven political distortion, voter driven political distortions, or you know distortion driven by international factors, for instance, we are going to integrate all those factors under one big umbrella, which is political distortion and distortion because it's a deviation from what things ought to be for development to, 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 to take place. So, and then when in this context, we think of history, history will be seen as a constraint that shape choices. And that can be uh, affected, you know, the structural factors driven by history can be, uh, you know, can, 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 can be affected by policy and institutional um, engineering. And then later on, I'm going to talk about policies and institutional reform that has proven to be effective in, in mitigating political distortion. So um, very briefly, there will be three models that I'm going to cover very, very quickly. One is a classic uh, paper by Barrow in 1990 that in which he basically um, developed a model of a role for public investment in growth. And then there is another paper on contract enforcement that highlight the role that government will play or politics will play in um, basically uh, ensuring uh, contract enforcement and property, and, and, and property rights. And, and another classic paper inspired by uh, Schumpeter, uh, developed by Aguillon and others, uh, focusing on how politics can affect innovation, technological change. And then, and as I said later on, uh, early on, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, follow this, uh, you know, uh, theoretical framework by looking at, uh, uh, you know, deviation from this benchmark, and 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 then look at policies later on. Okay, so. Uh, let, let me say one word about uh, you know what I really mean by political distortion. Political distortion are uh, political arrangements that that impede welfare, maximi welfare maximizing patterns of allocation of investment, and they can be strategic in a sense like it happened within an electoral cycle, for instance, you know, where firms capture, uh, you know, the Congress, for instance, or, 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 or some regulatory agencies to get favorable um, regulation. But it could be structural. It's structural when it's pervaded the entire system of political and economic organization that are very difficult to change. Like for instance, landlord, the military, you know, uh, 
So, so I want to make a distinction between what I mean by, you know, like a strategic political distortion and structural political distortion. Okay. So, um, in terms of political, uh, theoretical background, so as I mentioned earlier, so that you have, we have this classic paper by Barrow, you know, that development model where individual expand capital outputs that are conjection in absence of government intervention. So in this model, um, the growth rate is too high unless government intervene with uh, lump sum taxation. So basically um, it's a, a model that gives, which is more like a public finance, uh, you know, role to, to government to sort of facilitate um, uh, production and, and growth. So Aguiar, as I mentioned earlier, um, have a model in which uh, the party in power cannot commit. And this lack of um, commitment is higher when you have, you know, like disagreement, when um, you have a very, you know, you have different political parties um, unable to kind of um, develop a consensus of what the economic structure should be. And then uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Aguillon and uh, others uh, using uh, Schumpeterian kind of uh, growth uh, model to, to, to show how develop a democracy, not only uh, you know, help um, you know, the, the enforcement of property rights, but also how um, it can it promotes um, uh, innovation. How does it work? It works because, you know, like established firms can be highly connected to the incumbent. And the only way um, the, uh, you, you can have entry, you can have innovation, if, if there is a chance that the entrenched firms um, lose their political connection through turnover in government. So turnover in governments is actually, um, you know, it help innovation, and the effect is stronger, you know, when you are actually at the technological frontier. So um, the the party in power can do even worse. They can actually uh, block innovation and block uh, de uh, de development to their own advantage. This is the paper by Asimoglu and Robinson, 2006, when um, they talk about uh, how, um, you know, development can be literally blocked by, 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 by political winners, okay? So um, in general, so we, in this simple theoretical environment that have been developed, politics can play an important role in development, either through public investment or through contract enforcement or through um, incentive for innovation, technological innovation. Okay, so now let's start looking at, before we look at how this can affect, um, uh, you know, uh, development, let's, and how you can actually promote, uh, uh, you know, the development through the political process, let me uh, sort of look at the distortions um, that will, the political distortions that happen empirically and how it affects um, growth and, and development. So, okay, we'll consider three set of distortion. One is patronage and targeted redistribution. So uh, the, the one uh, important paper uh, along those lines is the paper by Burgess and others showing that democracy does a better job in allocating um, 
infrastructure uh, because you know they have the model in which uh, you have um, you know like the, you have basically change in political regime, democracy, and and dictatorships, and also uh, you know uh, change in the ethnicity of uh, uh, the party in power. So they look at uh, the effect of democracy on road expenditure on co-ethnics. And they show that the effect was present on autocracy, but disappeared in democratic time. So, so democracy is better as an institution in uh, promoting efficient allocation of public investment, at least compared to dictatorship using the case of, uh, of Kenya. There are several other papers where, uh, you know, uh, political distribution has been done strategically as an insurance for vulnerable uh, clients to get their vote. So um, this is, for instance, uh, a, 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 a graph showing road investment um, in Kenya. And, and you can see uh, from, from this, the distortion that happened uh, on, the, on the autocracy. I'm not going to go to, to the, into the details. So um, one example of distortion is patronage. You know, so basic patronage is the discretionary appointment of individual to government and political positions, um, which um, thought, which is usually thought as negative, but it could be used in a positive manner. So the close connection of firms and state in hiring practices can affect who get fired, or who get hired, I'm, I'm sorry, the quality of bureaucracy and policy implementation and which policy is implemented. There is a new paper um, showing how this work out in, in the British Empire. Uh, and it shows that, you know, uh, the efficiency of the effectiveness of uh, appointed bureaucrats um, is far less than those who were not, uh, you know, I mean, we, the bureaucrats that are connected were far more less effective than those who were not. And, but this gap disappeared when there was a reform that uh, limit the discretion of, of the government on the appointments of, um, of um, you know, of those governors, you know. So it shows how patronage uh, you know, basically have an adverse effect on, on the quality and the effectiveness of the bureaucracy. So this is an example, for instance, that can be used in several countries today. Okay, so um, the second, um, you know, example of distortion is contract enforcement. So there is a, a very interesting paper, um, you know, uh, published last year, studying the effect of court congestion in India on firm structure, productivity, and expenditure. And what they did was to look at what will happen if the congestion is reduced and they find that the, the, the you know, like limiting or decline in congestion has effect, has a positive effect on firm productivity and, 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 the, and the production cost. You know, so this table show the negative effect on of uh, you know, like lowering or, or making contract enforcement more efficient on the material expenditure um, in the total cost in, in India. Okay, so now the third form of uh, you know uh, distortion that I'm going to talk about is political connections. So and, and state capture. So. Um, Basically, um, you know, firms and politicians, sorry, and politicians can be uh, connected and this can have an effect on the tax rates, can have an effect on uh, market structure and other important uh, elements and important, um, uh, you know, aspect of the economy. So now the big question is how do you measure uh, political connection and uh, its effect? Uh, 
There is a classic paper by Fisman, um, you know, showing, for instance, uh, how uh, events about on Sohato's health uh, affect the stock, stock and security price prices of connected firms. And the connected firms are firms that through a membership of the board or other, or other, other type of uh, connection uh, are directly linked uh, to, uh, to, to the government and to Suharto. Okay, so now the question is how does political connection, how the very fact that, political, uh, that there is political connection can affect uh, the economy uh, can generate distortion that affect the economy. So there are two um, aspects that the literature has covered, two mechanisms. One is public, procure, pub, public procurement, and the second one is preferential uh, lending. So, um, you know, like connected firm, because of a political connection, we might be spending more on the same, uh, for the same services, or, it could it could be the fact that you know like uh, procurements are uh, you know uh, might be rigged or for instance um, the interest rates on loan for instance might be different for different firms not based on their productivity not based on um, you know uh, the economic activities but simply based on their political connection so uh, one important paper along those lines is by Kwajen Mian show, showing, for instance, that uh, political connected firms, those has, who has a politician board member in Pakistan, uh, have better access to credit. Their default rate is higher, and you know they get larger loans, and 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 then you know that default. I mean, this is particularly. Uh, you know, very, very high on government bank in government banks. And what is interesting is that uh, the results are stronger, you know, for politically stronger cases and in location where there is less political participation. So this will, sh this result, for instance, will show, um, you know, the relevance of voter mobilization and the quality of local governance on reducing state capture. You know, as something that Sarah is going to be talking about. You know, but then, uh, you know, the big picture here is that those political connections matter for for development, and we find that there is a dead weight loss from this investment, which uh, leads to zero fifteen to one point six decline in GDP. Okay, so um, what is the driver? of uh, political distortion is campaign contribution, not just in the US, but also around the world. And there is a classic paper, um, you know, showing, for instance, how the, the bidding behavior of connected firms are different, but then they converge after the campaign contribution, campaign donation has been banned in 2012. That's in the TNL. So um, now, the Schumpeterian insight that I talked about earlier has been empirically tested here uh, in, in this paper using uh, data from Italy, basically in which they show that incumbent firms um, and, and trench themselves by investing in political connection to deter the innovator's entry. And industries with more political connection have less innovation and older firms uh, in, you know, and they are, they are less, they are also less productive. Okay. So um, now there are several other papers that I'm not going to cover, um, but they all point to the same direction, you know, that uh, state capture and uh, political and political distortion coming from firms and corporate control of government and government agencies uh, is you know, is a big, big, big factor in in not only firm productivity but growth. Uh, you know, in, in general. So, so the big picture here is that differences in productivity that you know that drives growth and development have been seen at market base. 
you know, market factor or historical factors. Now, more and more, it's seen as driven in large part by politics. And politics, either because of, you know, like, uh, it, because of misallocation of public investment driven by politics, you know, co ethnics will get better roads than non co ethnics. This is what I would call voter driven political distortion. It could be driven also by lack of protection of property rights for those who are not connected or the firm that are not connected or the government in power, uh, you know, basically expropriating um, or over, I mean, cannot not be able to commit to respect property rights of, of those firms and economic organizations that are not uh, really uh, dependent or they're not connected to, 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 to that government. And then last, not least, it, state capture, you know, that works more, you know, in many cases through rigging public procurement or through like preferential, preferential loan or other factors, or, or also blocking uh, in, in innovation. Okay, so now, in, in a recent paper that I wrote with, uh, you know, uh, with colleagues, I show that political uncertainty alone cannot deter uh, state capture. You know, in the Schopenhauer model, so the control of government can be lessened as a, uh, by the threat of removal from office, but. You know, in a recent paper, we show that firms can adapt their strategy based on the level of political uncertainty. So, for instance, when you have a lot of political uncertainty, for instance, uh, you might try to capture bureaucrats and regulators because their term in office is not directly, might not directly link to an electoral cycle. Or you, when there is less uncertainty, you are going to go you are going to capture government official. So you are going to basically state capture might be direct if there is too much political uncertainty, direct meaning capturing regulators and bureaucrats who actually implement uh, you know, the, the policy or the distortion that you want to put in place or the state capture that you want to put in place, or you can capture um, you know, government Oh, sorry, you can capture a politician directly when uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, less political uncertainty. So it shows that, you know, like elections alone might not basically reduce uh, the distortion that we talked about. So institutional reforms uh, change in the nature of the states, like the regulation, uh, bureaucrat agencies. Um, have them not only insulate, insulated from politicians, but also insulated from private and corporate interest is very, very, it's, it, it's an important um, element for, to, 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 to make politics, uh, you know, beneficial or promoting uh, growth. Okay, so um, anyway, I, let me finish by then talking about uh, the, political um, implication of this um, uh, with a hope that uh, Sarah will um, develop some aspect of, um, of, of, of this section. So one is uh, banning, I mean, is limiting or banning corporate contribution, you know, so it had been proven to be effective. You know, regulation has also proven to be, you know, effective, like antitrust legislation, for instance, uh, you know, have proven to be effective. So it's not something that we need to think about uh, for developed countries like US and Europe, but it's something that becoming extremely pressing and important for developing countries as well. But I think uh, another important uh, implication is the supply of politicians. So how do we sort of select politicians that are not connected or where political competition is based not only on how competent you are, 
how charismatic you are, but also um, based on, on, on the fact that you are not connected, that you are not representing the interests, you are not representing corporate interests. You know, so that's a very, very important element that of political selection that we that has been covered in part, you know, by um, uh, you know a paper by uh, Sarah and uh, and Saad that hopefully um, Sarah is going to talk about shortly. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, transparency is very important. It, it sometimes it takes the place, it takes the, the form of uh, audit or government contract, uh, take, uh, you know, the forms of uh, political selection, as I said, but also civic engagement communication, you know, I, I mean, that last part is particularly important, you know, uh, in environments where you have low information, you know, voters, you have a lot of low information voters. So it's important that uh, you promote very transparent, very, you know, expert driven platform uh, you know, to get voters to vote on issues, not on personality or, or, or ethnicity. And uh, that would be an important way uh, of promoting um, development. I mean, promoting not only the quality or reducing political distortion, but also, uh, you know, like uh, contributing to growth and development. And more recently, there have been work on the on technology, you know, ID card, for instance, digital collection of taxes, um, that, uh, you know, like the uh, task collection using digital uh, technology, um, you know, as a way uh, to reduce not only corruption, but also uh, to make um, voters choice uh, more effective, you know, so, so basically, uh, you know, to summarize, uh, I think of uh, three set of policies. Uh, one has to do with, uh, you know, state reform that make government more transparent, that expose political connections of politicians and bureaucrats or regulators, you know, um, so that we can limit, uh, you know, firm driven political distortion. So we also uh, talk about you know, technology, for instance, that can help basically make government more, um, you know, more effective and um, uh, not only make the distributive politics um, more effective as well. And, uh, and also, you know, campaign reform, for instance, in terms of um, uh, reducing corporate donation, not only domestic, international, uh, that can uh, limit the extent of, um, uh, you know, state capture. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's what I have to say. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, looking forward to hearing Sarah's comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Leonard. Yes, that, that was great uh, and uh, sparks a lot of interest and uh, questions in, in my mind, certainly, and I'm sure in our audience. So let's, uh, let's turn to Sarah. Um, thank you so much. I'll just go ahead and, uh, and share my screen. Um, all right, so uh, thank you so much, Shanta, for inviting me to be a part of this. And thanks, of course, to Leonard for this incredibly insightful talk. Um, I'm going to speak for about um, 15 minutes briefly about um, sort of shifting the focus um, of this relationship between politics and development um, in a way that puts politics first. And it's of course an immense privilege and also a very intimidating task to be asked to comment on Leonard's talk. Um, his work on the political economy of development has been formative for, um, for so many. And I think one of the amazing things about um, Leonard's work is that what seem to be perhaps minor points on a slide or um, a throwaway comment on a paper can actually inspire an entire research agenda, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as an example of this, um, I want to turn to um, Leonard's 2003 paper, um, which is on a field experiment in Benin, varying candidates' public campaign promises to assess electoral returns to programmatic public policy-based platforms versus clientelistic platforms. And in this paper, he makes a point about the gendered returns to these strategies, which I think is really important for thinking about the rationale for um, 
participation based ways to um, to resolve some of the distortions that um, that Leonard mentions. So I think that this this these short two sentences have three big ideas. And the first of these is about the distributive distortions under clientelism having gendered implications. And um, I think that this is empirically somewhat understudied. Um, we have um, very, uh, very exciting empirical work from Argentina, from Pakistan, and from India, um, showing the gendered nature of clientelism, um, particularly in the composition of brokerage networks. But this idea of the distributive distortions being gendered is something um, I think that we, we don't know enough about. Um, the other thing that these short sentences do is establish the status quo of systematic exclusion as an explanation for gender gaps and political economy preferences. So we have, again, um, a body of literature that establishes empirically that there are gender gaps in political economy preferences. And um, work by Brule and Gaikwad shows that these gaps are reversed in matrilineal societies. Um, Iverson and Rosenbluth, um, uh, you know, they, uh, they look at um, the ease of divorce and labor market um, structure as an explanation for gender gaps, but I think framing systematic exclusion as the basis for these uh, gaps and preferences is a powerful um, is a powerful rhetorical strategy that Leonard uses. Um, and then finally, the policy implication here is that the increased political participation of women is a potential way out of a clientelistic trap. And here I sort of see echoes to um, work that, um, that, that looks cross-nationally at how the presence of women in legislatures has implications for um, outcomes of corruption. And um, there's been newer work showing that this effect is um, more salient in, um, in more competitive and transparent, um, transparent systems. So uh, sort of stepping back to recapping um, Leonard's large argument here, that political economy incentives can generate distortions in economic outcomes, um, and therefore political reforms or interventions that realign these incentives can help correct distortions. And here we see the potential for citizen targeted interventions that can shape political engagement in ways that shift these incentives. And what I see here then um, as an implication is that there seems to be a strong development-based rationale for political intervention and reform. And um, I think that this has, um, this has parallels with an approach of making politics work for development to the relationship between politics and development. And this of course is, um, is the title of the very influential um, World Development Report. Um, right, so um, what I want to do is um, shift the focus a little bit from making politics work for development to putting politics first. And I want to talk about, talk through three um, points or, um, or ways of, of doing this. And the first is to think about the logic of political reform. And here I want to talk about um, instrumental or developmental logics for reform um, versus normative political logics for reform. And then second, the political origins of reform and the importance of considering the process through which political reform comes about. And then finally, um, this question of how we might reconcile political commitments with goals, uh, strategic goals for making change. And um, I'm going to explore these three points through the case of women's political participation, both in terms of um, voter turnout and suffrage extension, as well as quotas for women's representation. So let's start with this idea of um, these in the instrumental and normative logics of policy um, reform or um, political interventions targeted at increasing citizen engagement or improving the quality of citizen engagement. So empirically, um, we know that there are gender gaps in political participation. Visualized here are the country level gaps from self-reported data in the World Values Survey on turnout. 
And um, the countries in green are ones where um, women report turning out at lower rates than men. And at the very bottom of the graph, you have Pakistan, which has um, almost a 20 percentage point um, gender gap in self-reported voter turnout. So why should we invest in efforts to increase turnout? And um, there is first an instrumental developmental logic for doing this, which is that absent women's participation, there's no electoral incentive for politicians to respond to women's preferences. And so the status quo of distributive outcomes in this case would be skewed towards men. And um, we have empirical evidence from the extension of, um, of suffrage showing that when women do participate, um, distributive outcomes skew in a way that are more in line with their preferences. And so this work shows the expansion of the welfare state in the United States following the extension of suffrage. But there's an alternative, um, though, uh, perhaps not mutually exclusive normative political logic, which is that equal participation is valuable for its own sake as a democratic principle. So I think um, I, I want to note that the instrumentalist logic on its own might leave us on shaky grounds for two reasons. So the first is, what if there is no underlying gender difference in preferences and then the status quo of distribution is not actually skewed? Where does that leave us? Um, and the second is the possibility um, that I document in my own work that um, given, um, given gaps in gender gaps in uh, preferences over public goods and services, um, what if women do not express their distinctive preferences? And indeed, this is what I find um, in, uh, in my work from Pakistan is that there is an asymmetry in the willingness to express distinctive preferences. Um, and so I think that uh, if, we, if we stick purely to an instrumentalist logic, um, there are empirical cases where we're left with these, um, this situation of shaky grounds from which to advocate for investment in greater participation. Um, and let me, uh, let me actually jump ahead and um, think about the case then of gender gaps in political representation rather than participation. Um, so we know that there's been progress um, since um, uh, uh, in, in the last uh, few decades on women's representation in legislatures, largely due to the introduction of quotas, but um, there, remain, uh, there remain gaps and we're far from equal representation. And again, when we think about um, the logic of quotas as a ways to increase women's uh, representation in different levels of government, we can think of the instrumental development logic um, being tied to the potential of the substantive and symbolic gains that there might be from women's representation. And here the empirical evidence of such gains is actually mixed because on the one hand, we have strong evidence from the case of um, quotas in local government in India uh, having implications for the enforcement of property rights as Rachel Brule documents. Um, for the representation of women's um, preferences as, um, as the foundational work by Jatabade and Duflo shows, and then also for the entry of women into brokerage networks and um, into higher levels of politics as Pavnani and Goyal show. But when we look at sort of the evidence of the, um, of the effect of quotas on substantive representation from national level quotas, the evidence looks quite mixed. And um, this is documented in a recent review piece by Amanda Clayton. Um, and so the alternate political normative logic for, um, for equalizing levels of representation is that this is somehow valuable in its own right. And this is something that, um, that Mala Tun writes about in, um, in her book on quotas in Latin America, where um, she pushes the idea of thinking about quotas as a means to achieving inclusion rather than representation. Um, and I think that this is what's important to consider here is 
not just whether substantive or symbolic gains are realized or not, but the possible peril of an instrumentalist approach to quotas. Um, and so this is something that is um, that's suggested in, um, in a paper by Rainbow Murray, which is that the instrumentalist approach to quotas and even the questions that we ask can lead to this trap of added value, where um, women then need to demonstrate that not only um, they meet all the same criteria as men for inclusion, but also have to provide this additional role of substantive and symbolic representative representatives of women. And so the instrumentalist logic for women's representation perhaps has, runs also the danger of, um, of creating the pressure, added pressure of, um, of double representation for, um, for women legislators and representatives. Um, and I think one of the points that I want to uh, put forward for uh, for us to discuss is, you know, I've I've presented these two logics of reform: the what I'm calling the instrumentalist developmental um, logic versus the normative political logic as um, as binaries. But perhaps this tension can be reconciled if we recover a more expansive view of development. And I'm thinking here of um, Sen's approach um, and Nussbaum's capability-based approach to development. So I think this is something that we'll hopefully have a chance to talk more about. Um, I want to go now to the second point about considering the political roots of policy reform. Um, and here I just want to return to the evidence that I had talked about before, um, which comes from work in economics, looking at um, the welfare impacts of suffrage extension. And highlight here newer work in political science, which um, does the job of sort of putting politics first while, when thinking about the effects of suffrage extension. And um, this work by Mona Morgan Collins um, highlights that the effects of the suffrage move of, of suffrage extension come not just from increased participation following extension, but from the work that the suffrage movement does politically de to develop group consciousness to mobilize women voters and to enable them to coordinate on their preferences and interests. And empirically, she shows that suffrage expansion did not affect the electoral fortunes of conservative politicians where the suffrage movement was weak. Um, and in contrast, it is where the suffrage movement was strong that incumbents with conservative um, voting records uh, suffered electorally. And I think the, um, the other uh, related point on putting politics first is uh, thinking about the, the politics of quota adoption, right? And so um, what, we, what we know about the effects of quotas um, for women, voters or in legislatures is um, that that's on the one hand, but there's also ways in which quota adoption serves to provide an institutional window dressing and reputational gains for politicians that um, and, and regimes that adopt quotas. And this is uh, documented in work by my colleague at Yale, Sarah Bush, um, in terms of showing uh, why politicians and regimes might want to adopt quotas in the first place. And I just want to note here that in the case of Pakistan, the most expansive quotas for women's representation in local government happened during a military dictatorship, right? And so I think um, it, it presents this interesting tension of how to reconcile um, quote unquote progressive reform with the gains that the adoption of that reform might give to uh, to an anti an otherwise anti democratic regime, and um, this put women's rights organizations and civil society organizations in a real quandary at the time um, about having to choose whether to um, invest in training for these um, newly elected women politicians and run the risk of um, of providing legitimacy to a military regime's policies. Uh, and I, this leads me to sort of this last point of reconciling political commitments with strategic goals. And um, I think I'm, I'm a little short on time, so I'll just leave this as a question of how even in, um, in our personal politics do we reconcile the goal of transformative change 
with investment with uh, investment in change on the margins. And I'm really curious to hear um, from Leonard, because who better than Leonard to speak to this, um, who's coming to these questions and this research from the perspective of political activism. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's great. And uh, both of you have kept to time, so we're uh, in, in very good shape. Uh, and, and very complimentary uh, presentations. Uh, I, uh, I don't know whether there are any questions that have emerged um, from the chat, but let me, let me just start with a question and that might uh, trigger a discussion. We go back to Leonard. I think Sarah actually partially answered this, but uh, I wanna hear Leonard, Leonard's view. Um, you know, you, get, you gave a very compelling uh, diagnosis of the uh, of the political distortion that it's and and you described it I think as a as an equilibrium situation that it's 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 uh, we're we're uh, constrained in, in in that way, but then when I look at your solutions, your solu you, you know things like uh, campaign reform uh, and things like that, they seem to be technical solutions. Um, now, if this is an equilibrium, how do we know, how will we ever achieve these technical solutions? Because the same forces that led to that distortion are going to resist these solutions. So, yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great point. And I, as you said quite well, uh, Sarah's comments answer the question partly. So, um, part of this, part of my policy, kind of recommendation is facilitates engagement. And, you know, like the work that I've done on policy deliberation in election and support for political parties so that they can select non-connected candidates and you know and, and making use of the information revolution to drive out bad politician if you will and get voters engagement to be more effective and based on sarah's comments for instance like increasing um you know gender representation and civic engagement by women in politics can be an important driver for those changes, you know. So, and, you know, because as she said, you know, like there is evidence that women leaderships tend to be um, more, you know, driven by policy or by kind of special interests. And that they also tend to be more supportive of programs, public investment than they are of narrow reducibility policies. And, and then it, it, we, we have to realize those are facts. You know, it's not just we wish that women participate better. You know, I mean, there is evidence that this is what's happening. So, so yeah, so I agree with you entirely. And it has to be, um, we have to make so three things. So we have to make like those ref technical reform you talk about, we have to make them part of what citizens want in an election or what kind of, you, you see what I mean? It's very important that we don't just advocate policies, but we also advocate institutional reforms that's more likely to lead to those policies. You know, so you see what I mean? So, and, and as a political, political economist, for instance, has to contribute a little bit more, you know, to this. And that's why I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's great that more and more political intervention is not just like helping governments to function, it's helping NGOs, supporting political parties, you know? So things that, can create a, you know, um, a strong demand for change so that change is more likely to happen. And then part of this is clearly what I have said, 
which has been mostly under, has been largely underlooked, which is the normative and positive impact of seeding engagement by women and women's representation um, in, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in politics. You know, and I think uh, those are, I think that's what I, I should say. So basically get voters to mobilize, create consistency for institutional change so that it's not those reform that I talked about is not going to be just top down, something that, you know, a good visionary politician will implement, but it's something which is demanded. The pe people see it clearly as important for development and to improve um, you know, welfare in, in, in the country, yeah. Oh, you are muted, I think. <laughs> uh, so let me use that to go to Sarah, because I, the way I'm under, understanding it is that, you know, in this, in this uh, tension between normative and instrumental, the problems arise when you try to uh, implement change based on the instrumental value. Um, so maybe the answer to my question to Leonard is what, where you were heading, which is just argue on uh, the normative grounds. You want women's participation because that's, the, that's what fairness demands. And, you know, we're not going to try to manipulate it to in order to get to better development outcomes. Uh, it so happens that we think it will lead to better development outcomes. But I think if you try to argue on those grounds, then then the, it's it's easier for the for the for the people who lose their rents to mobilize and oppose you. Is that is that a possible? I mean, you know, I, I'm, this is my amateur political science uh, <laughs> view. <laughs> No, I, I think that's that's an absolutely that's a that's a fair representation of um, of my argument. And I think what I would add to what Leonard just said also um, would be to um, to caution against the appearance or the achievement of um, progress on certain inclusionary goals um, that are that are measurable like turnout and um, adoption of quotas um, that can well coexist with um, repression of um, of civic engagement on other dimensions and so we can see this for instance in um, countries with um, with increasingly authoritarian tendencies that will nevertheless um, demonstrate commitment to measurable goals of women's inclusion that are more tokenistic, right? And so we can see support for women's quotas go alongside the repression of um, women's non-electoral political mobilization. Um, and I think that the non, uh, what the, what the, uh, the piece from um, Mona Morgan Collins was, was um, wh what I intended to demonstrate with that is that the non-electoral political mobilization is um, essential in order to reap the instrumental gains from the political, uh, from the political, formal political participation. Okay, okay, good, very good. Well, we have a question from the audience. Uh, so let me uh, ask, it says, uh, the question is, there's evidence from the Philippines that providing more information on the track record of political candidates can influence electoral choices, but politicians respond with more vote buying. So how do you make the optimal strategy for a politician to actually deliver change? So maybe, maybe I will start. So that, that, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So, okay, three things. So first of all, um, we need to be a bit careful not to blame voters entirely on political distortion. You know, because I mean, there is this tendency to say, well, you know, those places are not doing well because, you know, what do you expect? Voters are not, they are not informed. They don't know what they are doing, you know? So yeah, one day when they get educated, then we are going to get the right politics. You know, 
but you know we tend to overlook for instance situation like what's happening in south africa you know where the whole government was captured by international corporation like the gupta brothers you know like in brazil in the philippines in in benin everywhere you know where you know the biggest distortion i mean in this paper we haven't sort of sort of basically um you know we we we, we haven't tried to look at what the proportion of underdevelopment or or economic outcome is driven by voter-induced political distortion, or what, which one is driven by, you know, like a corporation or firm-induced political distortion, and see which is 50-50 or 75-25. This is not done yet, but I think we tend to just focus entirely on voter-induced political distortion, you know, which is, you know, but my my talk is to show that we have to pay attention to what corporations are doing, small and big firms even at local level, you know, even when in local elections, for instance, you have, you know, the, the, you know, the local card, card dealer that basically have the mayor and the bureaucrat in his or her pockets, you know, and rig procurement, you know, I mean, so, so that's one point. The second point is that, you know, okay, we have to be careful so that information provision to voters, it's not just like helicopter provision of information. You see what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, why, you know, so let's not drop some leaflets or let just like, provide some information and then things are going to be resolved. It's important that information is provided organically. You know, it's, it's, that's why the work that, uh, you know, Sarah and Saad and others are doing, for instance, on political parties are very important. You know, that's why the work we are doing, for instance, on um, on uh, like communic political communication, like whether you should do like uh, town hall meeting, whether you should have public debates, you know, the work on public debates, for instance, in Sierra Leone, all those works are very important. So it could well be, okay, let me put this way. Information cannot be intrinsically bad, you know? So better informed voters, I mean, there is no, you know, only perform better. But then we have to go beyond the information provision in itself to think of institutions, structure that you can put in place in the country, in political parties, so that the information which is provided is something which is generated endogenously. You see what I mean? Like where there are, you know, Organizations, institution in place to get people to come out about come out with this information more or less on their own instead of an outsider like whether it's a research whether it's a political scientist or international organization you know dropping this information on people you know you see what I mean so I think that information alone does not curve clientelism and vote buying. So that's why, and I agree with the evidence in Philippines is compelling, but that's why we should think of the institution, you know, the party organizations, the NGOs, so that people come, people learn themselves, people generate those information internally so that it can stick as opposed to, you know, outsiders. Okay, and then my, my first point is that we have to pay more attention to what firms and corporations are doing and not just focus on what voters might not be doing. Okay, I, I, you mentioned outsiders several times. So the next question, uh, and then I'll go to Sarah because she may want to answer both, um, is what can outsiders do to try and promote these sorts of political changes? And then there's a subsequent sentence that says, Afghanistan, maybe an extreme example, suggests that outsiders seem to make things worse. <laughs> so Sarah, uh, let me turn to you on that one. So, I mean, I think one way of thinking about this is um, recognizing that outside intervention generates a politics of its own, right? And so I think that is the generalizable lesson and that that can have really terrible consequences. Um, but I think that it's sort of, it's exemplified through this, um, through the logic of quota adoption point that I wanted to make is that once 
quota adoption becomes um, an internationally recognized goal and standard, then it creates a political logic um, and incentives for adoption that are in that are misaligned with the intended goal, right? So in this case, um, tying international reputation um, to uh, an access to aid to measurable progress on women's representation creates this kind of pernicious incentive for um, for for rent seeking uh, politicians to adopt quotas. Um, and so I, I would just say that that's an example of the way in which international action um, has political gener ha generates its own politics. So that's that's more of a framework to think about the problem. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, that's well. Let me. Uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, I'm, I'm dying to ask you this question, um, both of you, which is when I listen to everything you say, uh, which I agree with, it makes me wonder what I was doing at the World Bank for 29 years. Uh, because if you, if you think about it, this is almost the polar opposite of the way an institution like the World Bank, which is committed to development, functions. They're looking for technical solutions. Uh, and indeed, some of the normative aspects that Sarah uh, raised, we, we're even forbidden from, from discussing, like human rights. Uh, so you, you argue for human rights on instrumental grounds. So is there a role for an organization like the World Bank in, in development? Or should the, the World Bank completely overhaul itself in order to help foster the kind of change that you are, both of you are, uh, uh, are talking about. So maybe uh, maybe I'll start. I think um, so. First, we weren't very well doing a lot of politics without actually knowing that we were doing politics, because basically we were supporting governments. You know, we were supporting one party in power. We were supporting whomever is in charge. You know, so it's okay that, for instance, you broaden the intervention to include NGOs, to include opposition parties, on the not on the ground that you want, you have a stake in the election, but to minimize obvious political distortion. You know, so um, and I, I so 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 so. So, 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 so that's that's one. So, what, what, that's one important point. So, but I think we have to just we have to recognize, and this is what is missing in political, even political literature. We have to recognize that there are a set of principles in government intervention in in, um, in in the economy that we all agree with. You know, so for instance, that role should be allocated not based on where you have your votes, but where that will ma uh, maximize. Mark integration and and, um, and and access, you know. So and we are we have ways of seeing whether the actual this road distribution is far or close to that, you know, normative optimal. So and you know, like demanding some you know technical reform that doesn't deal with who is in power or not, but you know, reform the state to make it more transparent, make sure that redistribution, cash, the cash transfer, for instance, is done in a way that you know reduce elite capture. Those are things that are not political per se, you know, that in fact international organizations should care about and should be doing. You know, so so I think it's about broadening the scope of what interventions is and know that it's possible political intervention does not have to be partisan it doesn't have to be about election per se who wins or who loses you know and the work that sarah and myself and others are doing you know um is you know it's in this in, in this direction and and and, and some and the book uh, make politics work i think it's a good start as well to rethink about these things and um, and i hope that this take hold um, in, 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 you know, in, um, in at World Bank and other places. Just a final word on this. I'm glad that the question about um, uh, Afghanistan, 
Afghanistan is mostly perceived as military failure, but it's also a political failure. You know, like, why should, okay, so two things. So first of all, when people talk here, they allow, like, oh, you know, these guys, they don't know really what democracy is. We're trying to democratize them, it's failed because their culture is not democratic. It's complete nonsense. You know, I mean, democracy is something simple, you know, in fact, you know, like people want rights, people want voice. So this voice is blocked locally. So if we could be creative in a way that try to remove those political obstacles, not necessarily to military, but through some political engineering at local level, national, national level, maybe we can have got better results, you know? So I'm not seeing the, this aspect, you know, in terms of, could we have done the politics differently? Not us, but work with the relevant actors whose demands are aligned with the kind of politics that will help. And then see where, where, whether we, we can push things, help things in a selective way so that, you know, we, we become more effective. Anyway, so I, I think the general point I wanted to make here is that yes, it's possible political intervention can be effective. Be, it doesn't have to be partisan. It doesn't have to be supporting a given candidate or a given political party to be effective. And there are ways to do it. Absolutely. Sarah, um, I'm going to ask you to respond and maybe to respond to some of Leonard's points here, but then add a question that just came through, which is, can you pick a country or which country in the last couple of decades uh, would you pick as a success story in escaping this kind of captured politics? And in particular, uh, a country that has successfully empowered women in politics. Thanks for that. I think in, in response to um, the earlier question and Leonard's points, I just want to reiterate that I think the illusion of a political development intervention is exactly that. It's an, it's an illusion, right? And so to think that any development intervention is apolitical, um, I think runs the risk then of not accounting for the political implications that it does have, and leads down the path of greater potential for negative consequences. So I think just from, um, from an analytical point of view, it's important to recognize, again, that politics of intervention, and that can help prevent bad interventions um, to some extent. Um, I think, I mean, in terms of um, countries that have, um, that have been success stories, um, I mean, I, it, it's hard. I think the the sort of the 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 canonical example of is um, is of the um, is of welfare states um, uh, is of welfare states like Sweden, which have been able to um, which have been able to provide um, policies that, in a sense, that I, I would say in a sense recognize or correct for some of the inequalities um, in within the household division of labor, which are really at the root of a lot of gendered inequalities that we see in the political realm. Um, but I think we also can, rather than looking to success stories um, at the country level, we can yeah. look at perhaps the small details of policies that have enabled success. So um, going back to the example of CODAS, the preponderance of positive effects comes from India, and that's in part because of the randomized nature of the quotas, which has led to all to a lot of studies. But it's also because of the specific design of the quotas being at the local level. Um, which is very different from quotas at the national level, and also the quotas being for direct elections. So Pakistan has had quotas at the, at the local level, but the women are elected indirectly by the elected general councillors that are um, that, that happen to be all men. And so then the, um, the, the root of accountability is not to voters, but to that council of men, right? So I think thinking not just at the country level, but thinking about these, these really small details of institutional design that can have outsized impact for the consequences that we might see of these policies is, um, is the way that I would go on this. 
Okay. Actually, that's a very good way to conclude. We're actually at, uh, out of time. So uh, all that's le left of me is to thank uh, both Leonard Wanchikan and Sarah Khan for an excellent discussion, a very lively uh, and provocative discussion and actually quite uh, profound in its implications. So uh, th this is really exactly what we wanted from this, uh, from this uh, session and for the series as well. Uh, so thank you both very much. Thank you to the audience for their questions and for participating. Uh, and it's my pleasure to conclude this uh, fifth seminar in the Future of Development series. Thank you both. Thank you.